I used to be a policeman. So. You killed the reanimated corpse of Winston Churchill. How do you, <laughs> like, at a certain point, what do you even do about that? What you know? is this to do about it? <laughs> like, it was, what was it? It was it, it, it was Churchill, Chamberlain, Thatcher, um, Blair, he's not dead. But... We can fix that. <laughs> it's really um, not. And they were, and they were, and they were, and they were, and they were all just in this giant, like, British Voltron in the shape of a teacup. There, there will be a knock at the mm. door later for that one. Yeah. <laughs> If you you destroyed the British teacup, Voltron. What, what, what do you? What, what, how did you manage to see, do I that? I can see that coming from a mile off, Luke. I can see the news story now, mm -hmm. back in an hour's time. Yeah, yeah, with yeah, this yeah. conversation yeah. getting brought back up, <laughs> saying, "Look, he was talking about it, Blair." Local bit, siege caster yeah. kills Winston Churchill again. <laughs> How'd man <to> keep down? <laughs> oh my god. At approximately 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, a known Rainbow Six Siege caster was accused of the murder of another prominent British figure for the fifth time this week. So that's been the hammered. <laughs> yep, thank you. For We're already done. That's it. Thanks, thanks for having me. Uh, <laughs> oh man see to we be were clear. literally just talking before this podcast went live we're like hey we don't have to take ourselves seriously anymore no. because other people can do that for us we can just bullshit because mm -hmm. who's gonna stop us so i figured clear, we started I've off broken with no laws today i've broken uh, today uh, that's all i it's a very no. <laughs> just thinking i don't know it's today is a very it's a very specific time frame <laughs> All right, well, oh, okay. at this point, I need to go through and check for a review because I, f I totally fucking forgot to do that again. You forgot? God. God, guys, Apple Podcasts, please leave us reviews. We'll read them out because it's good content, and I, I, I really mm -hmm. can't be asked to go and leave reviews on my own podcast because that just doesn't seem genuine. So please, let me scroll through and try to find some shit. You were fine with the first 400 caliber. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. They've, <laughs> they, 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 they've been okay. <laughs> Yeah, we really are that desperate for this shit. Okay, one second. I'm looking. I mean, you've got nope. us on, so... There's the one that says better than B-leaguers. That one's always hilarious to read. Scroll, 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 scroll. I've realized I've worn a green screen-esque t-shirt, and that's probably a mistake in hindsight, but... <laughs> I'm, th I'm this far in. I mean, I, I've just... You, you remember know. what happened when the Queen did it, Flute? Yeah. And you know she lived for their memes. We know the queen loves a good meme. The queen I loves. I bet she's got. A, I bet she's Queen's got a really good memes. like yeah. collage of those as a desktop. I hear. Yeah. Uh, I hear the queen is a redditor. I hear uh, she knows when the narwhal bacon's. Oh, that's an old reference. That's, it's an old and terrible reference. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How the fuck oh, old is that? What? God, it's got to be a decade that's old a at this point. Yeah, 2010, 2009. Like, it's just awful. Ish. Hmm. It's just that awful. sounds like that era of online. Yeah. Mostly because I haven't heard the word narwhal in any serious context since that era of memory on the I internet. I have never so heard what? that word in serious context. <laughs> You've never heard <laughs> <laughs> Why does anyone come out and say the word narwhal? Narwhal got associated with some mystical being in internet lore and all of a sudden everyone Who just forgot about what the fuck it actually was. How many pub quizzes are you doing? Sitting there like, this tooth whale, like, hmm. just don't worry yeah, guys, I'm a narwhal Last time expert. I was at the zoo. Alright, here we go. Alright, cool. So, I'll read this one and then we can kind of jump into the rest mm -hmm. of everything. Sorry! Hi, I've delayed the podcast because of my absolute inability to get anything done because I wake up 20 minutes before every episode, so I'm obviously fucking frazzled. Anyway, it's a five-star review. It's titled, One Out of Five. I didn't want to- I, I just didn't want to mess up the rating. Like, he, the, he's, he's given it five stars, but he, he's, it's actually a one-star review in his head. It says, they only talk about stuff that's not Siege for three-quarters of the podcast. Make it longer. I mean, Make he's asking for more. So yeah, he's asking for more bullshit. There's got to be some sort. You yeah. can't give it a one star and then ask for more. That's <laughs> those two things don't really work, do they? It's, one star. I mean, this podcast to one more. star. It's one star. It's either he's or. Just really interested in getting as much. If you of want this more, as you it's a minimum three star, surely. If you're asking for more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if you if, if you want to go back and change that rating to say three out of five next time on next yeah. podcast, I'll look at it and yeah. I'll I'll provide an update. Uh, the, the uh, this person's username is. G2 takes it. Motherfuck. <laughs> nice. 
I mean, he's I not wrong. But... He's not wrong. I mean, no, no but I just, I, well, I, I will he? never, I'll never be able to escape the meme. Oh wait, I can literally never escape the meme. Nah, you're stuck with it. <laughs> I'm stuck with it. Okay. Like, uh... So, very, very, very fast. Uh, at the time of recording this episode, we are obviously under an hour away from the European League starting up uh, with its first five games of the season. But, and like to that end, we also understand this podcast is usually gone in like in around like the hour and a half to two hour mark, sometimes the two and a half hour mark. So this is kind of a speed run in a sense. We're gonna try to get through as much talk about the EU well as we can, and we obviously stole two wonderful guys who've worked in uh, European broadcasts this entire time. Very happy to have both uh, Ace of Pyrite and Captain Fluke on the show to go over this with us because we're not there in Europe. We don't know it nearly as well. Even though we we like to think that we know it, we're going to get everyone's opinion on how we think that this season is going to play out for everybody involved. But keep in mind that this one will obviously be a little bit shorter of a runtime than other episodes have been, so apologies for taking things a little bit seriously, but that's only in the sense of runtime, so Mm -hmm. we'll try to make things as quick and as painless as possible, and if you're still alive by the time this episode is finished, I'm very sorry. This was not our intention. We were supposed to lull you into a false sense of security, have you fall asleep, but then you'd never wake up because this podcast is just that boring. So... (laughs) This podcast is the digital version really of the Apple us up as from, guests. Yeah. I mean, yeah, no, just no, sell really, it. Honestly, sell, really if, sell if it. If you're Jacob. watching today, yeah, today it's me and Ace. Um, you're gonna fall asleep, and it's gonna be the worst out of all the episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Technically, I think the worst of all the episodes, it. if we're talking just from a, a sheer viewership perspective in terms of like how much it got on YouTube, I think it was the one with Gregor, because Gregor is a YouTuber and has very little connection to the competitive scene. I, we loved having him on, but we talked about... A we talked about almost ba- on a bus, bus station. Whole time. Yeah, bus station <laughs> bathrooms <laughs> for like 20 minutes. Honestly, I, only <laughs> reason bad. I came on the show was to talk about that as well. <laughs> Oh shit, do you have a similar experience of almost puking on a bus? No, no, I want to talk about Gregor's story again. <laughs> uh, I want to I want a second background. Uh, is there anything else that we need to talk about Gregor's I'm, I'm trying to find any relevant point other than, yeah, I was trying to save my frat, and in the midst of trying to do that, uh, we got screwed over by American public transport, uh, and someone I know projectile vomited in a bus I mean, bathroom. at a certain point, like, who hasn't been screwed over by American public transport? You know? As someone who had to take public transport to and from college for an entire year, and it was an hour and a half in one direction, I can say I've been screwed over. Yeah. It was terrible. No, it's absolutely hell. This is back before I had a car. I had a license. No, I had a permit still. I was 17. I started college at 17. Couldn't even fucking drive. God, that was the day. I hated that. Okay. That was, that, they flew, that was my first year of film school. Was your first year of film school nearly as shitty? <laughs> um, I... From the bits I remember, it was good. Um, it didn't mean much. First year of uni in England, or first year of film school or whatever, doesn't mean a huge amount towards mm-hmm. your final degree. It's like 25% of everything, so it's like, yeah. you can really half ass a yeah. lot of it. Um, I mean, and, yeah. yeah. It's also important to remember that remember. back when Fluke went to university, um, they were called kinetoscopes. <laughs> yeah. It was something you had to churn. You can't tell people how old I am. No one ever really knows. So it's like a no mystery. Ever, I'm know. dying soon, probably. <laughs> He's 54. I'm 54. Uh, just whatever you do, don't go in his yeah, attic and see that painting. That's the most important yeah, thing. Don't look at the painting. There's a, yeah, there's a painting somewhere of me. And if I don't. look at it, I will very quickly don't. freeze up and die. It's funny because you were pulling filters out earlier and what I'm happy to be a painting. I, I was it's just a like, Dorian wait, Gray it's, joke. I can't believe we made a only, Dorian Gray joke. I know. This is how old I am. It's just, that's an- <laughs> <laughs> I just I You're gonna pull that up when we're talking about something really sad. I'll, I'll transpose the sad piano music over it. Just like, yeah. Yeah. Look at this less poor- Less than five minutes to the filter's sad. getting broken out. <laughs> yeah, less than five minutes. I have so many of those. And yeah, I found out I not long the before filters. the podcast. I can put custom ones on as well, so I need to get that sorted for the next broadcast. Oh my that's why God. I'm not. That's why I'm not that's cast anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's let's. Uh, that's the point where I think we can rein things in. Great job, everybody. Great tangent. Now we're back into business. So. European League starts up today. It runs every Monday, Wednesday for the next five weeks, and it begins 10 teams in one massive round-robin stage. I guess probably one thing I know, it's been a topic of debate this entire time since we had all the format news come out. The idea that it's still round-robin format, best of one, and online, it's 
the idea that it has so little of a change from what the previous European Pro League system looked like compared to all the other regions in Siege that now have such drastic changes, to me, I look at all of the things that are happening for this season and I don't necessarily have an issue with a lot of it. I think the the biggest thing I had an issue with to start with was the fact that we still have an auto relegation system put in place, but it was a point that I think Fresh brought up and it, he, he mentioned that if you are the bottom team out of these 10, which are Europe's best, arguably the world's best teams, all together in, like, over the course of an entire season, if you are at the bottom of this list, when this entire season is said and done, then you absolutely do not deserve to be in the middle of that. Anybody want to chime in on where they kind of stand on how that auto relegation fits into EUL? I mean, I think if if um, if I could, I think auto relegation is a bit of a cultural thing. I think when we see complaints about auto relegation, it does tend to come from, and I'm not trying to set up like an NA versus EU thing, mm -hmm. but I think yeah. generally speaking, North American sports, of which I'm a big fan, uh, Packers fan, Detroit Red Wings fan, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> I've watched plenty of American sports, and it's just not a natural part of the process to you mm -hmm. guys to have that promotion relegation aspect. It's You have champions of the season, and that's it. You know, you, you will generally vie for position in a draft or some sort of advantage but other than that you stay within the league whereas within Britain and Europe as, as you know looking as a, a wider scale it is just so normalised um, you know the biggest sport we've got is without a doubt football soccer to you guys mm -hmm. um, is without a doubt it is absolutely normalised every country around Europe has multiple divisions and there is promotion and relegation between them so to us it's it's sort of like just par for the course. It's, it's what we've come to normally expect from competition. So I think there is a cultural element there. But I think if you look at it, the thing that I said pretty much, I think it was on the, the thread that you mentioned of Freshers. The, the big point that I made was you've got to think about this as an investment perspective as well um, for organisations. And you have to have the ability to move into that pro league. But you've also got to give people a reason to stick around if they're not there, you know, if they're in the Challenger League, there's got to be that possibility of getting easily into that top tier division. Um, and also, if teams, you know, do have to drop out, which I think is a good thing, it rotates things around, it gives players an easier opportunity, there's got to be that promise of coming back because then we see, like Team Secret did for a good while, organisations stick around. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's also something to be said for, you know, and this is just my, like, vicious Machiavellian streak here. If you don't want to be auto relegated, maybe don't come in last. Yep. Yeah. Right. And that's like, that's you, you know that's a horrible thing to say, but if you want to prove that you are one of the top ten best or top nine best siege teams, you have to go out and do that. And if you can't, maybe go down to Challenger League, practice for a while, come back up when you're ready. It's the thing about our region as well is historically it, it's been very diverse and very deep in terms of every little national scene has its own very strong identity mm -hmm. and not only the kind of players obviously that we see break through but the names and it used to be very stoically set of like this is a French team this is whatever with only a couple of teams like G2 back in the day that were an amalgamation of all the different ideas and kind of fundamentals from all these different scenes NA has the face of NA NA is this massive smother of it whereas ours is a system where there's so much competition that's broken up into so many little factors that our focus had to be of getting all of that together, which with an auto-relegation system, you kind of need that because there's so much being fed from so many different locations into our CL, which then gets fed into our kind of top tier. Like, to not have an automated guaranteed system means that that kind of lifeblood would just stagnate as time goes on, so we need that tension. Mm -hmm. To me, I'm, I've... I've looked at it from where we had relegation in previous Europe's se or Europe seasons, but that was back when we had eight teams and now we're sitting with ten. To me, it it, it, it kind of speaks to the idea that they want to stick within, you know, having a larger format, having more teams be involved, and they can kind of give more teams additional breathing room because you have two more spots in this upcoming season of the EUL than you did for any other season of European Pro League. So now you have two more spots of, I guess, grace if one team's not able to perform at nearly the, like, the level that we expect them to. They don't have to climb, you know, like 
like several more positions up. They only have to get like like two more spaces compared to where they would have been if we still had the previous EU Pro League format from a couple of seasons back. So to me, if they were to you know have a really really like just suck season, they have an ability to still kind of like revive things if they feel like they have a chance like closer towards the end of stuff. But at this point. We also have to remember that it's something that we combine multiple stages across. It's not like, oh, you have one really bad stage and all of a sudden you're you're done. No, you have to do it based on uh, a combination of how every single stage for a whole season all plays out. So if you have a bad, you know, five weeks, you have one bad stage, you can come back and have a much stronger second or third stage in the case of 2021, and then your fortunes can completely reverse themselves. Provided that, you know, you put the work in, you find a way to, to, to counter everybody who's that space or two above you if you need it, and because the competition in Europe is so tight, I'm curious if it's going to quite literally be a, like a, a really, really fierce fight to see who gets relegated, or if it turns into a situation where we have maybe everyone playing on a similar level, and then this one team right there at the bottom that just goes, well, I guess we're here, and I guess we're done. Bye, guys. See you later. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't think that'll be the case. I mean, coming again, looking at the sort of traditional sports background, it is as interesting that this is the other thing that it creates. It is as interesting at the bottom of the table as it is at the top of the table. Yeah. If you've got mm-hmm. a table where coming bottom doesn't really matter too much because you're not getting auto relegated, you can't win this season, you start getting that sort of mean mentality for teams where it's just like well we'll come out and do whatever because you know what it's too far gone for us to win it we're out of this one and the season's a write-off whereas the season is never a write-off here you're fighting for your place if you're down at the bottom you're still fighting for something and it keeps that interest and tension and that's you know from personal experience that's what I've seen over the last 20-30 years of watching sports is that it keeps both ends of the table really really interesting death games are always some of the best as well yeah like death games everything is on the line everyone is playing to the end like you see it obviously in double limb you get like a little glimpse of that and a quicker aspect but to see these teams having you know these kind of like it's such a little dance of those last few games it can completely change how a team balances its tactics going in and where they think they can pull some life from it it's you know that's as you said it's a whole other story like it's it's exciting when you're going into a situation where you know one of these teams will not be here for the next season, mm-hmm. it's like, hey, like, well, honestly, uh, it's kind of the similar scenario when we have that ninth place relegation game for the first place team in, in CL for EUCL when when that season is over with. So, tenth place team gets relegated automatically, but the ninth place team still has to play that one match to see if they stay in. Just that one game right there. It's like, well, one of these teams will be in the EUL next season, and the other mm-hmm. one's going to, you know, will either drop down or will stay where they're at. And you just already know, like, the stakes for them are just as high as they've ever been because of what they have to go through, the adversity that they have to truck through, basically. And I think I, I, I like that, but I also do like the idea of a sudden death match one of these two will not leave these this arena alive kind of thing that 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 storyline is always it, like probably more intriguing than watching like a grand final because you know well oh, one of them's gone see you later bye which one of you sucks less i mean we had that in um we had that in european challenger league in season 11 sort of where it was there was a point where penta's fate was completely out of their hands yeah you know, it was uh, it, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was basically a it was a three way race to the top, and no one had any idea who was going to, you know, win. And that was. And I love those. I love those top mm. and bottom. I love sitting there a couple of games from the end and thinking, right, if they win this, but if they lose that, but if they right? win by five rounds, like <laughs> I love that sort of stuff. And coming up with all these permutations of what can happen, mm-hmm. you often see me in the chat, and I'm like trying to explain <laughs> it, and I'm like, right, you know, this is going on yeah. in this other game, it, so this yeah. means this, and if like, it's I love maths, that stuff. I do. If it's if it's maths where I'm willing to put in the effort to learn and understand it, it's actually exciting. <laughs> oh, like. <laughs> otherwise, it's. <laughs> but that's what you need me for, Fluke. That's what you need me there for. You need the bullet points. <sighs> if someone doesn't break this down for me into factoids, I won't understand what it means. <laughs> <laughs> Give me the simple term. This couldn't get any simpler. No, it's but you're three right. or one. <laughs> I do like it when people are able to explain, hey, by the way, we're in like the last week or two weeks of mm. whatever season we're in. 
So this is what could happen if this team wins and this team wins, this team loses, but this team needs a win or a draw to stay in re- like blah, 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 any of those mm-hmm. possibilities every time someone mentions it. I remember doing that in North American Challenger League when we're getting down to the last two play days and we're all asking each other, hey, does somebody want to crunch the numbers and find every single possible thing that can happen in these next couple of games so that we can talk about it? It's just like there's so much that can go like well or wrong for any team that's in any league format. And when it comes down to like the the wire, which is to say the very, very, very end when you know it's a last chance situation, teams have only one more opportunity to fight for something. It's so goddamn cool, man. I love it when we get to that point. What's, like Navi, when they ended up obviously winning the position to get into the actual inv- uh, the kind of pro league final stage mm-hmm. and get there that was in the final two play days i think it came yeah. back yeah just, i think it was yeah. just from other games happening around them they were able to find their way into the that's it and from from four days out it looked completely unrealistic yeah, and, yeah entirely. just following that process through and mm-hmm. seeing it happen was unbelievable it was it was just so much fun so why you wouldn't want that at both ends of the table and just double mm-hmm. it up i have no idea oh yeah absolutely uh, I, I think remember... that, that's where oh go ahead I think it was. God, Try. What was it? It was. Was it? Secret? Throw your mind back. It was secret and orgless. I think it was season nine, back at the race oh. for the bottom. Boy. Yeah. And it was just this like is actually a good one. who would come in seventh and who would come in eighth because both of them were just constantly tripping. And I think what was it? It was orgless came in eighth because secret just slapped the shit out of G two twice. And those were the only two games they won. Secret have this habit of... Or X-Secret. They will X, be like... X, X-Secret. Rest, X, X-Secret now. R- rest um, in peace. Rest in peace. <laughs> the players have all gone on to other stuff. And I'm really excited to see... Cause obviously, they're a team very close to my heart. Love all of them. Leon guards tonight. Keep an eye. But I guess we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, <laughs> but they're a team where they would either have these absolutely historic runs or the seasons when they were in CL or wherever where it would be the entire opposite and it's like if you put them on a stage they blow everybody out of the water but as soon as you put them in the league it was like come on guys please <laughs> <laughs> I came in really started watching Siege uh, like the back end of season 8 then came in for season 9 and when I did I'm like oh secret like that's an org I recognized from the two times I've watched Dota ever so I look at them and go I expect them to do good it doesn't happen and then can they climb back out of CL no no. Can they do it again? No. no. And then they're just gone. Well, they're not They're not gone. Pretty much everyone no. in secret. C- credit to them. I Literally everyone, with the exception of, I think, Jonas, who's gone back to retirement again to do his, his, uh, who's, his who's, online rally career. Yeah, he's going back to dirt rally pro league or to whatever simming. he's doing. Yeah. yeah. Well, all I see from his Twitter is just retweets of him doing events for that. But every yeah. everyone else from that squad has managed to find another spot on another team and whether it be as a player or in Meepy's case as an American analyst congratulations to him for getting the bag from E United that stuff's cash mm-hmm. everyone from that team has managed to go on and find some success someplace else we will obviously keep on putting Leon up on a pedestal because he's on Rogue so everyone will look I mean, at him I'll and put go Leon, oh, so you- I'll put Leon on a pedestal because he's Leon fucking Goddens I don't mm-hmm. you know he's one of the best players Gosh. to ever grace this game mm. Just everyone I'm excited to see what Funkus does. Yeah, on like a, a kind of smaller scene, a smaller stage. Mm-hmm. In a way, there's a lot less pressure for him to kind of live up. But I'm curious to see if it changes what he does and what he brings towards the team. When you had, you know, the roles that Secret had for such a long time and the players that they had there for ages, like Funkus is on new M and M, right? Yep. Yeah. 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 I mean, you've got to look at what Funkus did before. Team Secret to, you know, he, he fulfilled a different role within Secret when he was originally on Eminem. So, for anybody who doesn't know, this is Fonka's second time with Eminem now. He was with the Eminem roster um, whilst they were just before they won the Premiership and just before they started on the Challenger League run and became Na'Vi and, and everything else. He was there about four or five months before that, I think, if I recall it correctly. And then he moved across to Secret. Completely understandable decision at the time. Secret were Pro League mm-hmm. um, and came knocking. You know, it was it, it, obviously what he thought was for the best. Now, Fonkers was an absolute gunner on the M&M team. There was, that's where Fonkers' bonkers came from. It was There was no question. He did unbelievable things. We 
both Luke and I cast him through the Premiership, and you know we saw him so many times. Such a such a good mm-hmm. player, and he just never really managed to show us that at Secret in the same way. And whether that was maybe he's, he had, he had moments. Don't get me wrong, he, he certainly had moments, but just that consistency that we used to see from him before, and whether that was just how his role fit into the team alongside a fellow gunner like Leon, you know, where maybe he was having to play in a slightly different way or something. I don't know. I'm surmising at this point. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right, Fluke. I can't wait to see Fonkers back involved with an M&M roster and just see exactly what he can mm-hmm. do. And it could just be a new lease of life for him. Well, it's, it's, it's hard to be, you know, it's hard to be an entry fragger when you have someone like Leon Giddens on the team, mm-hmm. right? Or when you have someone like you know Yunus yeah, the, yeah. like well, Yunus was kind of the way yeah. he was playing especially uh, as he was on Secret where it was just this is the aggression and I am bringing every single cent of it and mm-hmm. it's yeah it's it's in a way it's kind of like um, the crying change a bit where they kind of had this amazing performing fragger in CL they bring him up to G2 things don't quite work out not obviously in the same translation but then you put him back down in CL and then he ha- starts having a game again and now he's back it's one of those again it's a curiosity now is like is chaos going to be a better fit for him to like have a little bit more space to be mm-hmm. what he could do on this less pressure driven roster it's still he just, just got so it. many variations so many yeah. counters there's so many factors that come into things that like you say you can be absolutely gunning on one team and you can go and play in a similar role but just with different people around you maybe playing one operator different all of a sudden everything changes and it's because there is so many minute factors in siege mm-hmm. yeah and i mean take a look at um you know like what happened with um, Virtus Pro, right? You know, it's just they made what, like one roster change, and now they're just ridiculously powerful. That's it. It takes something and nothing. Sometimes it really does. You know, it can be the smallest thing that we see completely change a team's fortune, whether that be for the better or for the worse. You don't always know, um, but it, it can be the the smallest things. I think the one thing that needs adding to the conversation about Fonkers is that he is the nicest guy as well. Mm-hmm. If you've never had the chance oh, to meet Fonkers, mm-hmm. you will be very lucky to meet him <laughs> one day. If you do, because he's absolutely great. He's a scream. He's very funny, but he's a really nice guy as well. Fonkers holds a, he holds a special place in my heart because he was the first pro that followed me on Twitter. It's like when I first started doing anything related to any Siege content, he was the first pro. So he actually hit me up at one point. He's like, hey, I'm really, really happy to see where you've come. You've done a lot in terms of content. Keep up the good work. And I'm like, bro, I want to give you a hug because you you were literally the first person that mm-hmm. was like, hey... Well, the best part this about this guy's not totally stupid. Like, like keep up the good work, man. I'm like, thank yeah. you. I love your face. Thank well, the you, best, Fonkers. The, the best part about Fonkers is he's also like five six, so he's not threatening at all and infinitely huggable. <laughs> <laughs> he's like this tall. It's adorable. <laughs> we can't go an episode without making a height joke, can we? Nah, he's just short. And when, you've got, and when you've got me on the guest list as well, that's just yeah, ridiculous. Was, was <laughs> that's just that's a low blow. Man. You, that's hey, just it is, one of the, isn't it? Yeah. One of my favorite things. One of my I favorite set things. Up and you knock them out <laughs> the park. Eh? One of my favorite things is the drawing um, that Deadbird did, which you've got on your wall behind yes, you. The one so good. of you and I. Ooh. It's just, it's, I love it so much. I so, like. I want a print of it. It's so good. So, and so I remember seeing it the first time. Oh my word! That's awesome. It's so, so good. If you don't know, X is like literally the size of a Neanderthal. Like he's built <laughs> yeah, like he's a, a caveman, right? He's a big fella. And so, X and A is well, not doesn't the same help. Thing. It doesn't help the think, situation. He is a big fella. I'm gonna try and put this back up. <laughs> when I, I, when I, I ran into him. him yeah, like I ran into into Fluke and X in the gift shop at Montreal. At the no, you've never run into me. You goddamn Fluke wasn't there. I know. I no. Sorry, I wasn't sorry. There. It was me. Ace and Extra Troika. Did I did I say Fluke again? Yeah, Why I did. did I get you and Ace mixed up? That's weird. I haven't I met know. anyone. I'm not actually real. Yeah. I mean, you you, you are 54, so we yeah. all know no one lives past. Yeah, yeah, I can't leave the industry. I'm one of those like animated YouTubers that you see. Go yeah, he's a virtual YouTuber. Nice. Yeah. And when they can't get a real caster in, they just. You're as real as those BRBI. really, really old gifts that you showed us on, on the program you have before mm-hmm. we started the mm-hmm. broadcast. That I can't do for cop- uh, copyright reasons. Um, 
Yeah, you get it. If I ever, I, I have can't the, randomly have Sonic show it, up on the podcast. Yeah, I have the red button to like. If you start talking about things I don't like, oh, I'm pressing it. Here comes Sonic. <laughs> Here comes Bugs. Here comes Sonic, and then I just press the stop stream button immediately yeah. and just go like, "Excuse yeah. me." And just like, "Bye." Yeah, that's <laughs> I can crop that out at the end of the episode. <laughs> that goes. That goes. All right. Uh, talking point, sort of talking point number two. What do we think about the two new teams that are coming into this season? So in this case, it's the brand new German Forge Team Secret and our newcomers in Temper that used to be the French Is a Dream roster. Any well, initial thoughts? So I'll, I'll talk about Team Secret for a second. Um, that yeah. team has had like an insane amount of roster changes, but they've also existed for a very long time. Um, specifically the 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 duo of Lazo and KS, right? Yep. They've been they've been around for a really long time, and you know they've been pushing, they've been pushing. They, they were around for literally so long that when they were competing as Orglis, they made jerseys. They had did they make jerseys no, or did yep. they just nope? They made they jerseys. Did? They had they the, like, jerseys. the standard like pro league jerseys that, that let ESL sold that didn't have like any affiliation with the nope. team whatsoever. Like they made jerseys for themselves. They had Orglis jerseys. Dang. Okay. So that team existed just for like a year and a half, right? It was it, it was a long time, and then they started getting, um, you know, they they had a coach in Lazo, and then one of their players dropped out, so they had to go get Lazo in as a player, and then other players left, and other players joined in. But that core of KS and Lazo has always been there. And recently they got um, a new coach, uh, Omerta, who's been sort of around for a while. I, you know, I first... In our scene. Yeah, yeah. He, he's been in the, the prem scene. Love, he was just the, dumb one player's or one coach's like comp or uh, contribution to the siege scene as... He's been around for a while. What? He's been around. <laughs> Okay, so what? He, he gets around. He 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 <laughs> starts. Did around. he start on Horus? No, he was around before Horus. Um, mm. So Omerta was was very much involved with coaching Horus, um, mm -hmm. and then pretty much moved on. Uh, I think from there, not necessarily directly, but give or take to Orgus. Um, but yeah, he'd been involved previously. He knows he knows an awful lot about the game. He's very very dedicated um, at what he does. Um, he's he takes things yeah, very very seriously. Um, mm puts a lot of work a lot of hours in and he's a nice guy and um, very approachable he's helped me out a few times we've had a good few chats about uh, about different things strategy wise and casting wise and things like that um, but yeah that's I think something that can probably be extended I would suggest to the rest of the roster and the mm -hmm. team now for Team Secret is going to be that you're going to see um, a lot of organisation a lot of time and effort and work being put in the foundations will be there uh, believe me this this is a team not to sleep on. Yeah, this um, is this is not a team to give up not. on because they have been grinding pretty much without pay, without anything for the majority of them about a year and a half. They've just yeah. been going. They won GSA, they won Challenger League, you know, and this has not been easy for them. It took them literally since they dropped out season 9. Um, mm -hmm. They got relegated, and it's been a year and a half since then, and now they're back. You know, it, it's been it's been a hell of a long time since we've seen Lazo and KS in Pro League, and then they're also bringing three players who haven't been in Pro League with them. Um, and it's just, you know, it's going to be There's crazy. There's a lot of ability there. There yeah. is a lot yeah. of ability there. It's one of those curiosities, because we see them in... Again, coming back to like how our scene is very spread out, is obviously we've got all the national leagues going on where all of these teams have generally, almost all of them have been playing in these national leagues as well. Some have just started. Secret so far haven't been having the best time in the German league. I think they're around mid table at the minute, off the top of my head. Um, they're so not I'm doing hard. And just like Rogue is also not doing hard. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's. Um, oh, yeah. It might be Rogue that mid table and. I'm trying to remember it now um, but it's one of those things where I'm curious to see if this is because obviously G2 have been going through it but G2 have been G2 for a while now they've kind of had their gunners they have everything laid out they're probably coming into this secret with a little bit more of a okay we need to pull stuff back we need to take what is our element of surprise and be able to use this so they have a bit more of a start because historically there's always like one promoted team that doesn't do very well and one promoted team that does do very well mm -hmm. and I think at this point with this longer play year both of them are looking at it as like 
we need to get off to a good start here. We kind of need Izzy Dream to be the one that stumbles first. Or X Izzy Dream, now Tempra, to be the one mm. that stumbles first. Do we think that Tempra's going to stumble comparative to the way that we've known Secret to operate since their time in Orglis? I don't want to just cast them down being like, yeah, all of them are pro league rookies. They don't have a chance. But compared they're to the rest so of the good. talent pool, they're, they're a really yeah. good team. Don't get me they're wrong. They're so good. I, mean, they, they I remember talking to Stur- uh, Chad, remember when you and I were talking to Sternab about how he thought uh, Diffuse Kids, now Lowland Lions, were going to do in PL, and he was like, we're really only concerned about Is a Dream? They yep. won the whole freaking thing, and all of us were like, well, he was yeah. right. God yeah. The thing about them winning as well is if you want to have a look at how their season started slow in CL and then play those five, six, and seven, they went unbeaten um, in those final like six matches. Uh, Mm -hmm. I'm thinking it might be something a little bit similar here where they might lose the first game or two and then start to kind of get themselves together and get themselves kind of tuned on. We saw a little bit of it off uh, out of or before the league started. We've seen them do their first French match the other night as well. And like they're a team that if not mid table, like probably potentially battling for higher up, if they get themselves the same role that they had on CL, because towards the end it was just like, oh wait, well that's a that's a game to Izzy Dream. Let's see who else we can look at. Yeah, and I mean when you look at the Izzy Dream versus Secret matchup, um, in their most recent matches, it was, you know, um six six tie between Secret and Izzy Dream, and then Izzy Dream previously took them seven three. Um which map was this? This was on border, right? So it the 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 matchup between is a dream and secret generally favored is a dream. I think the matchup with anybody against Izzy Dream in Challenger League favored Izzy is a dream. dream. Yeah, they, they were very very good. But what I would say, um, and I said this coming out of the previous season of Challenger League that BDS came through so so strong in. Um, Every region at the minute in Siege has its own strengths. That's it's one of the really mm-hmm. interesting things about Siege at the minute. So you look at North America, I would say they've got the strongest teams in the world at the minute. TSM, Space Station. Mm-hmm. They are, for me, the strongest teams in the world. The strength in EU, for me, is the depth. I don't feel North America has got necessarily the same level of depth um, as EU. I think you look at the EU League and you have got a hugely stacked league. Like, Who, honestly, do you want to play today? Because I don't want to play any of them None on of them. the first like, liter- week of the None season. Of them. It is so, so stacked, and it's been like that for a little while. And when you're coming in from Challenger League, it's a phrase that I've used a few times that people laugh at on cast, but it's welcome to big school. It's you're coming in, and you've just been the big dog in Challenger League, and we saw that Mm -hmm. from BDS. They absolutely rolled people, and then look at what happened through the Pro League season. They struggled. They kept themselves involved, but they struggled. And honestly... I think it's going to be tough for anybody to come out of Challenger League into the EU League and just wash through it like Navi did. I think that is the exception, not the rule. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I I would agree. Yeah, I'm looking at these matches right now, and I've been trying to figure out, you know, what's a highlight or a standout match that we can <laughs> talk crazy. about. And I'm just sitting here and I'm like, well, there isn't one because all of these matches are nuts. I had yep. this. I had this the other week when everyone was like, "Oh, this is the new super team." It's like they're all this super awesome. teams. <laughs> yeah, like, what are yeah, we yeah, yeah. Like? yeah. Like they're all just trading players to each other, and everyone was like, "Look at all these super teams." And it's like, no, they're all just really, really good. Like, <laughs> like yep. there are no European super teams. Uh, the only two pe- teams I wouldn't consider super teams are Secret and um, Tempra, but that's because you know they're not pan-European inside their region. They're some of the best teams, right? So, Tempra is one of the best French teams in the world. And Secret is, like, third in German, coming only in second to two other pro leagues, right? So, we're not talking about, you know, oh, they're they're, they're a good regional team. and that's They're all fucking insane! Mm-hmm. They're yep. great, but in the context of the rest of quite literally the best competition that Europe has to offer, somebody, again, going back to the relegation thing, as good as we think these guys are, one of these motherfuckers is leaving when this season is over. Yeah. And they don't have a choice. Like, we we can sing their praises, like, the whole time and go, well, they're so good, I can't pick a winner, these guys are just that, God, first week predictions are just so hard, what do I, God, ah! One of them's going. But that's, again, 
that's why auto relegation that's part of why auto relegation works in eu because sure i guarantee that there are another two or three teams of this quality sat waiting in challenger league by the time that comes around and there's going to be no concern for the teams that come in and fill those spots Absolutely. and that is the point the depth in eu goes beyond the top tier and that is why auto relegation works because you know I've spoken about this countless times you know when you talk about whether there should be a playoff match between the two or not I like that the winner of Challenger League goes straight into the league I like if you win something you win it you win a prize you've won Challenger League you win the prize of going into the EU League and Mm -hmm. I think it's easy to look at the teams at that point in time and say but the Challenger League team isn't as good as the Pro League team at that point in time but the point is what's the future potential there and we don't know it's a question that can't be answered until they go into the mix so for me get them in and let's find out I don't mind that idea either rather than winning a chance to go to pro league you just straight up go to pro league yeah mm-hmm. yeah i really I, I really don't have a problem with that like in the slightest S- second place you've got to go and win another match so second mm-hmm. bottom has the chance to save themselves absolutely fine but for me if you get that crowning glory in challenger league here's your prize bang you've earned it and and i like that because that adds the tension as well yeah you know i think you know going back to this it's this is the first week, and we have really haven't seen any of these teams play in any seriousness besides the Challenger League team, because I think literally every team has made a roster change. I think I was just scanning through that exact thing. The only team that technically hasn't made a roster change since the last season of European Pro League is Na'Vi. But they only had, what, the last two weeks with Doki when his... his ESL ban expired. Yeah. So, yeah, we haven't really seen them play consistently with panics either. So right. there's there's a lot to be said for Navi as well. And that's been interesting because usually for the last few years it's been the NA roster shuffles. That's what it's always been. Yeah, yeah, and Europe, yeah. Europe have sort of sat there chuckling away thinking, yep, yeah, we're okay. G2 <laughs> yep. are sticking together. We're still going to win everything. It's fine. Then, um, but this time it's really hit us hard. <laughs> yeah, there's I mean, been a lot of changes. Over. Well, when you make it to the finals of you know the biggest land in the scene and none of your teams are represented besides one like national team that only spoke french i would expect there to be a ton of roster changes right yeah it's just we have you, that oga yeah where uh oh, we yeah. went out to croatia there's loads fair few eu teams everyone was feeling quite good then after the first day it was kind of like all the EU cast team. <laughs> it's getting it kind of stuffy in here. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, God. It was rough. I, I mean, look we, at OGA as the time where this meme was born. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we look at. <laughs> so never, thank you guys. Yeah, we look at all of these teams right now, and this is these have the possibility to be, and I'm not discounting TSM or Space Station Gaming. But if these teams can gel, some of these teams have the possibility of being the strongest teams we've ever seen in Siege. And I'm specifically looking at Vitality when I say that. Because Vitality has every element they need to just absolutely fucking roll people. I agree. Right? Vitality is yeah. one where I all the players are known commodities, but them as a team is not a known commodity yet. But they're the ones that I probably put above Rogue in terms of newly formed super teams that <laughs> has probably the most potential and the highest skill ceiling. I, think I just I'm, don't know how they're going to do collectively. Well, see, I think they've kind of got a good hand having a first game against BDS. Because mm-hmm. if they were up against a more aggressive, complete frag-driven team, I think it would start to see them be pulled apart on the first player day. Having a team like BDS where, yeah, they have Shaiko doing Shaiko things. They obviously have Velems as well, who's such a great kind of head to keep a, a bit of mid-round adaptation and stuff going. Mm-hmm. They're a slower and steadier team, which will play more into fresh vitality favor, more into, okay, well, we can pace this a little bit. We can try and find a little bit more ground mm-hmm. before we find ourselves under the intense pressure that Rogue would put down or G2 would put down or, you know, those kind of oh, yeah. quick-to-the-gun teams. I mean, you look at, you look at this, right? Vitality. It's got quite possibly one of the strongest IGLs that this game has ever had in Fabian. 
Mm-hmm. It's got one of the best supports in Goga. It's got the king of European entry frag, Hungary. Right? And it's Can't it's, argue it. And then you have Rise and Bibu who bring up the flank on flex. And you look at this and you go, Jesus Christ, this is nuts. Right? But you have to think of that in context, which is, well, then we look at something like, I don't know, let's look at Rogue. You know, Vitality in a vacuum is a strong team, but every other team around Vitality is just as strong on paper. At least until we get into the first couple of weeks of the season, yeah. then we start to see how everything like, like slowly begins to take shape. And I think this also kind of goes for uh, for Rogue's first game. Rogue's got G2, which, by the way, I made I made a mistake. I said that Na'Vi was the only one that hadn't made a change this last season. G2 has also not made a change since the last season of EUPL. So they're coming in, having a lot more time, a lot... Le- the- Everyone on their roster is considerably like less fresh. I think Citizen and Virtue have both had plenty of time at this point to acclimate with the way the G2 works. Mm-hmm. They've got killer support. Probably, arguably, the, be- the best coach... No, unarguably, the best coach that this scene has ever seen and one of the best analysts in SUA. Shas and SUA are going to put that team on their fucking backs to make sure that they can get a good first game against Rogue, if not a win. You still have draws in EU. I hate that you have draws. I'm sorry that you have to worry about that. But <laughs> Rogue has a very, very very tall task against a team that for all intents and purposes I don't see a reason why G2 doesn't you know make every single major like like this year assuming that they you know for the two that we still have they actually go somewhere mm-hmm. so Rogue has a very 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 steep hill to climb as well just breathe that in dead just let that just let that sink in G2, it's a, I don't know, is chat on a delay? Can I interact with chat? Am I allowed? Is that breaking the rules? Uh, you can break the fourth wall. You can do whatever you want. I'm going to break the fourth wall. Afi's you, bringing up, I love Afi. First of all, shout out to Afi. Uh, second of all. Actually, we can't. Um, yeah, no, legally this podcast is anti-Afi. Oh, what? Yeah. Hmm. It's, all right. Well, then, it's, for, it's, to it's be on the podcast, for now, I'm kind of anti-Afi, but okay. secretly, I'm, I'm wearing an Afi t-shirt underneath my other t-shirt. It's okay, that's fine. As uh, long as you're publicly yeah. facing as, anti-Afi. Yeah, as long as yeah. I'm hiding it, that's fine. Yeah. Um, they are working, living in a team house. Um, yep. Obviously, that's a newer thing for EU. Um, it is more historically in NA, and obviously, all of NA is moving over to Vegas at some point. Um but yeah, having them all kind of be in the same place and working in the same environment. As you said, they've been the, together the longest, which is for the first time for them in a while to be the team that hasn't had these big changes because it was always all eyes on G2. What has happened to G2? Oh my God, G2, please. But now it's this moment of, okay, well, a lot of that has faded. A lot of that expectations. They have time to kind of get themselves together as a team and, you know, push past where all of the kind of doubts and all the expectations were and really bring themselves into this new league mm-hmm. yeah g2 I, I i've gotten flamed very much for using the word that i'm about to use but in the context it will all make sense comparative to their 2018 run where they stomped through everything g2's 2019 run post invitational by comparison was extremely mediocre or medi- mediocre a lot of mediocrity that's what i'm trying to say <laughs> that's what but, that, that's only in the sense of how they performed in 2018 and we yeah. can you know lump lump the 2019 invitational into their year three performance obviously but when everyone looks at how g2 tried to navigate through 2019 it was a massive slippery slope and everyone's trying to figure out you know where can they make this one slight adjustment to kind of like turn everything around and everyone's like oh crying's coming in crying can maybe do something uh that this was the same year that we had uno come in and uno has very very clearly been a phenomenal addition so there's nothing really wrong with how uno plays in crying comes in everyone sees it as a fail because of how they use him he's not a bad player he's just in the wrong place at kind of the right time so he's able to find a team afterwards but he's still very much in a a very like off-putting position because he's not doing what he like typically does you know from an entry role not being forced on different you know roles it's it's been well documented but now we head into the invitational time they haven't won anything substantial they've still you know placed high at events but you know they have enough space to get that six invitational invite spot as a result of that but then they bring in sir boss crying's off the team then everyone's just like wait what the hell is happening you know it's it's really really weird to see a team that's had so much potential and so much success as G2 come into a situation where they are, you know, they're 
almost like they are playing and acting completely foreign to the way that they used to, and it's only been a year since they had, you know, relative success. It's only been a year since their 2019 Invitational victory. And then they come into 2020, and everything just seems like it runs, they have a little bit of gas in the tank, and then nothing. Mm -hmm. So, for me, I'm, I'm hoping that both of the changes that they've made in both Citizen and Virtue have all the potential to go as high as G2 can possibly want. Like, the, it's there. I, I don't see either one of those as necessarily bad pickups. There's no way that you can call it a bad pickup because that was the first time we were talking about super team in the same sentence as Europe teams. Because everyone was like, oh, it's a team of five fraggers. Holy shit, this is going to be incredible. I just don't know when that's going to translate to the same amount of success that G2 had in, like, you know, the same 2018, early 2019 era. I think the thing that you've got to remember with G2 and the G2 dynasty, dynasty, the success that they had, mm -hmm. was that G2 were a long way ahead of the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Evil Geniuses were the only team realistically challenging them at that point, and we all know how that went. It didn't really end well for the North American side, and G2 were a long way ahead. We've been waiting for this mythical G2 team to return. And I'd argue that that team never really existed. They never existed in a world where they had to beat seven, eight, nine, ten other great, fantastic cores of teams. And now it's a different landscape that they're operating in. So us sitting waiting for G2 to return, I don't think we are. I think we're waiting for the first time for G2 to really step up and perform in the landscape that we've got right now, in mm -hmm. the level of competition that we've got right now. And I think yeah. that's something that we need to remember is we haven't seen that success. Like you said, the last success that we saw from G2, and I take, I, I need to be very careful, I take absolutely nothing away from G2. Mm -hmm. Big fan of the roster. Their accomplishments are not to be written off whatsoever. Yeah, they were the best. Like, yeah, they were. Yeah, far and away. Without they question. They, they were the best and they were fucking far ahead e for a reason. Yeah, yeah. They mm -hmm. have helped build this esport no question. Oh, yeah. Top yeah, to bottom. Yeah. But we haven't seen them have success in the landscape that we're in now. And it is very different to what it was 18 months ago in terms of the number of teams that can compete for those spots. It's a vastly different ball game right now. Mm -hmm. It was one of those old arguments you used to hear quite a lot as well. And it's something that I've heard from a few players and coaches and whoever throughout is that what the, that kind of era and what G2 then defined was having the structure towards how they would develop things. It was Shas kind of taught the world how to be a coach and he was apparently very, very great about it. Like he'll kind of move out with his folders and you'll just see stacks and stacks and stacks of work and you go, oh, that's what they're doing. Like, and because of that, a lot of other teams started to develop and it was a period of time in Siege where there was kind of two styles of teams. There were the ones that were developing the meta and developing the strategy and the ones that were reacting to it and kind of playing a little bit more catch up and a little bit more aggressive. And you used to see you know, back when they were IDK slash secret being a team that would develop that. But G2 were the starts of that. They were the kind of head honchos of developing that. And in developing that, they developed the game. And now it's those lessons are across the board. They taught the dynamics of how to run what would become a great comp team. It's an unfortunate double-edged sword because, yeah, they flew. But now it's like, okay, well, we got to try and, you know, find that again. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, Sorry, one last point and then I'll try to make a transition out of here. Sure. So when we when we look at Europe, it's it's I, I think the, the, the main focus that we all have is we have on paper the two strongest challenger league teams we've ever seen. Two of the strongest challenger league teams we've ever seen, rather. Yeah. And eight of the possibly strongest pro league teams that we've ever seen just based on roster moves right we've seen people that we know are proven move into roles that we know they've proven of and other people move as well so that the 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 question today when we watch european pro league and as we move forward is which of these teams are going to congeal and which of these teams are going to start cracking a bit you know yeah, I mean, I'm curious about the first play day. I think everybody mm -hmm. is. Obviously, we said it before, 
and he said it in messages to me earlier today when I was like, hey, what, are you, what have you put as your answers? Who do you think is going to win? <laughs> uh, when I was sat there like that, covering yeah, my work. I'm like leaning over like, <laughs> no hey, what cheating. are you Luke, point? Luke, stop. Oh, no you're, cheating. Don't call oh, me. You're going to bring up that point? I was going to bring up that point. Um, is that you could throw darts at a dartboard and yep. to get results today. Like it could really, a lot of it's going to come down to maps as well. Um, I There's a big part of me that wants to see uh, New Oregon um, mm-hmm. and see that get brought out a little bit I, it's like mixed possibilities the first day cafe was in a play pool it was played every single game like it was every single yeah every single the very game on that first play day 10, I remember that mm-hmm. and then we saw theme park once on day one and then we didn't see it again and, uh, until like day like four play days later because um, it came in halfway through so it was like day eight and then day 11 we saw it so it's like I'm hoping I'm hoping we see a little bit of it tonight. I'll be I don't know. That's just a side thing. I'm sorry. God, no, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm distracted by uh, by the stream, which at the time of recording this has just started, and Milos <laughs> is looking sexy. Oh, he always he's got does. No, Ace. Oh, you, I, I don't know if you're seeing this right now, but he's got a shirt that would I make am. you jealous. I, mean, <laughs> I didn't have it open. Like, you're probably. Too- I, I, just, that gets that gets a two thumbs up from Ace. That's a nice that's shot. Uh, <laughs> that's good stuff. Love to see it, buddy. All right, so remember. we're gonna try to keep this one going. I need to hit stop hitting my mic, Jesus. We're gonna try to keep this going up until the first game actually starts. We have like some probably like some EU pleasantries to go through, like some basic overviews and whatnot. So it'll be we the, have about you know, fifteen we'll, minutes left. Yeah, we'll probably yeah fifteen minutes until the next one begins. So we've talked uh, extensively about a couple of teams in here, but let's let's go over some of the other ones that we haven't been able to discuss nearly as hard. Let's talk about chaos. Picking up crying in the off season, grabbing a German to fit onto an all uh, Nordic team. Uh, everyone had already switched over to English comms after, you know, it, it, Chaos used to be all Swedish, they bring in Shate, and now everyone's speaking English, and now they're bringing in Kryn, who had experience on G2, which was an all-English-speaking roster, so it all works out in the end. Red Groove, Renewals, Vito, Shate, Kryn. At the end of the day, I don't want to put them in the lower bracket of teams, because we all, we keep talking about everyone in EU being such a, a very, very good contender, but in the context of how they performed in the last season, and what I'm seeing from them in the Nordic Cup at the moment, I know they're not, they're not taking the Nordic Cup nearly as serious, because they're already in PL, so they don't have to, but but I, I keep on in my head putting them kind of towards like I guess the lower half of how I expect teams to do. And uh, anybody else have something similar? I think so. Chaos is weird because chaos. <clears throat> chaos has always been weird. I mean, chaos is chaos. You know, yeah. they 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 really yeah. live up to their name because you don't know who's going to show up. You could have They're hard to predict. Yeah. It's chaos so should be predict. awesome. Chaos yeah. should be awesome. Yeah, entirely. And you see them, and you've seen them almost do that for ages. I remember, yeah. like, casting them out in, in, like, the Hamburg Allied qualifiers, and they're having these absolute sledgehammer games and all of this stuff, and you see them, and you're like, okay, yeah, this is... And they, they were one of those talking point teams back then where everyone was like, EU is the best region, no doubt. Look at we got the teams that win everything, and then we got these backup teams as well, like Chaos. And you're like, but they could... They should be breaking through, and they've had so many of those opportunities, but they're so unfortunately hit and miss and I think them looking at obviously their problems and looking at potentially uh, bringing new support staff obviously Fresh is now over there as well Um, like it's I'm hoping that they just find just that little basis of solidity to tie a good season together it's another one of them situations and I'll repeat a phrase again that I've used before and that's on paper Chaos are an extremely good team and Mm -hmm. should be doing very very well unfortunately Siege is not played on paper and that's the reality you you know the the sum of the parts should be very, very good. But like you say, consistency has been a problem for them. And who is going to show up? Which team are we going to see? Are we going to see the amazing chaos or the frustrating chaos? Um, and they are another one of those teams that could just have easily an outside run and just stow them through six or seven games in a season, just beating everybody and surprises them be up near the top of the table. But equally they could be fighting for the life they're a completely unknown quantity of chaos general opinions on adding crying to the roster crying's a gunner I've yeah. been mm-hmm. saying, I said it since before he came to G2 uh, challenge league season 10 as you know I do a lot of stats crying yeah. is outstanding 
Let, well, let me promise you that Crying is outstanding if you want to see how good Crying is get him on course line and put him in office and see what happens just see who gets control of aquarium and office because I tell you now there's only one person left standing at the end of it and that's Crying he is unbelievable not just in that one specific area he's but playing that a 1v9 springs... is going to kill his entire team plus the entire <laughs> that, other enemy team lot. he's that good it's, yeah honestly that, <laughs> that springs me, yeah. to mind for me for Crying if you want to see how good Crying is go and find a couple of games where he's played mm-hmm. on course line and he's been on defence he'll have a C4 he'll play in office and he will dominate course line from there he is mm-hmm. really really and good they also, and, and we haven't seen the best of yeah. him yeah and not only did they pick up Crying, they also picked up Fresh. And Fresh is, um, I, I would consider Fresh sort of an evil genius of strats. <laughs> like, I don't, you know, there are people who make good strats, and then there are people who make, like, oh, we're just going to fucking run to Chanka, right? We're just, <laughs> that's just happening. That's a was strat the Chanka we have. play during the Invitational? Was that, that was Fresh is bringing up? Fresh. Yes. <laughs> oh, like, I love that. We're just going to stick now. someone below the Tachanka so he doesn't what, get shot. But if you want to push him, go yeah, die. I know you, right? mm-hmm. It didn't like, work. It didn't work. Point. Right? <laughs> fresh is. Yep. I, I, don't, I don't understand like how the fuck his brain works. Thank God I don't understand how his brain works. But if I were to pick, you know anyone to coach that team and just understand that chaos is chaos and you sort of need to strat around that i would pick fresh so I think have I you seen fresh the film too. the accountant i can't say I it's like yeah yeah it's well the idea is he's like a really great accountant he's crazy good with numbers it's that but if instead of going around and killing people he just wanted to make siege strategies <laughs> <I think> that's <laughs> the that's that. That's the edit. I'm not sure it would have been a box office smash. It wouldn't have been a box office. <laughs> no. They probably wouldn't have got Affleck, let's be honest. <laughs> Affleck's more into Dota, unfortunately. Did you hear yeah. that? We, yeah. we just we just compared Fresh to Ben Affleck. You're welcome, mm. Jack. You're welcome, Jack. we never did anything for it. It'd have to be Vin yeah. Diesel. It'd have to be Vin yeah, Diesel or somebody Vin Diesel could play. Vin Diesel playing Fresh 100%. Without question. You're welcome. Uh, yeah. You're welcome. Jason Statham playing Ace. Absolutely. Ooh. Oh, yeah, we, if we, we were to figure out who would play everybody in a biopic yeah. Yeah. And then, if, yeah yeah when we make yeah. the biopic transporting yeah. a briefcase of stats across the world <laughs> <laughs> don't worry guys I'm coming in hot with last season's stats it's just you I'll get it there he I'll pops open there. the trunk and instead of like you know a hot babe that he has to transport just yeah. pops it open and it's just dead, dead. Of paper. Dead. just sitting there like <laughs> it's just <laughs> dead <laughs> Just reams of paper. That's all there is. Mm-hmm. All right, it's we just... got about 10 minutes left. Let's try to rock through a couple more of these if we can. How about both Russian giants? Want to start with Empire and how they've kind of fallen off a little bit? Um, yeah, Empire. Um, so Empire had a very good way of doing things. And the I, the way that um, I rationalized Empire was, if you you might not remember, I don't know, the NA side, probably not as much into soccer, but um, Spain were really dominant in world football for mm-hmm. about four years. They won the World yep. Cup and they won the European Championship back to back. I remember the- Nobody could get anywhere near them. The the style that they were playing was in the media referred to as tick attacker football. Um, And it was just quick, short passes, bang, 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 a lot of speed. Um, And people couldn't get to grips with it. And eventually they did. And Spain didn't change. They carried on trying to play that way. And that's what I see from Empire. They were extremely good at what they did. And they still are good at it. But people have got very used to playing it. And it's almost Mm -hmm. as if the transition to that plan B, the transition to that new style has been difficult for them. Um, And it's just that's where I think they've dropped off. They're another G2 where the rest of the world have caught up to what they're trying to do. um, And they've just dropped off a little bit, but still some very talented players and they'll still be there or thereabouts. Absolutely. Uh, Virtus as well. Um, It was one of the things as we were talking about before is how good they are right now. Um, It's good to see that because when we had their experience during CL, like two CLs ago, they were one of these like big Tour de Force teams. They obviously knocked out a lot and then they kind of got to uh, Pro League and nothing quite connected and obviously, unfortunately, at the time CL was still kind of growing, so a lot of people wrote them off. And then you started to see them have these one or two play days or these one or two tournaments where they were able to really do bits and to have that structure now where obviously they've just taken Empire in the Russian League Finals, 7-2, 7-2. Like it was pretty solid sweeps across it. They ran through the upper bracket as well. It's 
they're such a scary team right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, everyone's I mean, kind of I don't I don't necessarily want to say everyone's kind of writing Virtus off as being meh, but they did have a meh season at the very very oh, end. Oh yeah, 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 of, entirely. Of season eleven, everyone's like, well. We expected them to do good, but they're coming from CL, and they didn't do too hot. BDS didn't do good either. <sighs> maybe maybe this wasn't the best graduating class from Challenger League. But then they stormed through the Russian Major League, and they obviously won the Open Clash. But, uh, I think it was when we had Dez on the podcast a little bit ago, I think he was like, well, everyone looked like they were taking the tournament not seriously, except Virtus Pro, because they memed the least, is what it seemed like. Uh, and to, to their credit, they looked really freaking good it's scary yeah. good yeah and i don't know if that's just because everyone else wasn't taking it you know nearly as 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 hardcore as they could have or if it's just a sign that virtus is going to you know go that hard in the paint week in and week out i'm honestly more excited for how they can perform than empire at this point and that's just because empire has been on the slip and now they've added a player in all ways that i just i just don't know who he is because i don't follow the russian scene nearly as much mm-hmm. so if he can show up and perform and, you know, figure out what his role is faster than Karseka was able to figure out where his problems lie, then great. That's phenomenal for Empire. They got this, They got the whole, the thing they needed to fix the hole. But to me, VP is coming off the probably one of the coolest org signings we've had in a long time and are on, you know, a two-tournament winning streak. As far as I'm concerned, I expect them to just storm through stuff. One thing as well to note is before this, um, they, they never had support stuff. When mm-hmm. they were forts, they didn't have anything. And now they've got an analyst and a coach from them, which they obviously got when they were signed with Virtus Pro. Having an actual support staff now, mm-hmm. that is a complete game changer for a team. Like, you don't realize how much work can be done there. I talked about it before, is how Shas kind of defined that aspect of the game, which is one of the things that made G2 so strong. They finally got you know a place to kind of build strats build ideas and build stuff and kind of bring it together and it takes a lot of pressure off the players and especially the IGL to have to try and learn everybody week in week out yeah let's see who else we can get through here all right six minutes we still have a couple teams we can talk about very briefly (laughs) (laughs) rapid fire rapid fire rapid (laughs) fire speed run speed run lightning round uh not as Vincere Navi's Navi they're good let's see if Panix fucking pulls his weight this is the most like, solid they've been. They've had, what, six months of Doki? Is she? Isn't she coming back? Who knows? And now they have that. They have that idea. They have that solidity. They obviously have Panics now as well, which is a proven player and tried and tested. This is something where Kendry can really get his head towards the team and go, sorry, I'm talking really fast, and go, this is where we need to make everything work. Because <laughs> for everybody else, it's been up in the air. But for Na'Vi, for the first time in like a season, they're like, this is us. Let's play our game. Yeah. Yeah, I think consistency of roster will definitely help them. It was it was a strange situation following Token Army. There's there's no other way of describing it. They came out and absolutely dominated there. And a large part of that was the professionalism they showed. They turned up and every minute was spent practicing. They they were there to win that tournament and it was no surprise that they did and the play was awesome. But towards the end of it, you saw these tweets and these messages like we need to go and rebuild and you're sort of thinking Huh? Like, you've just absolutely dominated this tournament. You need to go and rebuild. And, you know, but obviously, the, you know, the, obviously there were issues there because, and obviously they could see them because we saw them come away from that and it the results did drop off and, you know, they did have those issues there. And, and ultimately, hopefully, they've steadied the ship. I've got a lot of love for Na'Vi. Um, as I said earlier, you know, casting them all the way through as a roster from M&M through the Premiership or, mm-hmm. you know, and seeing them come through that journey and that process and those changes and getting to cast them in the opening game at, the, at SI was, you know, that dream come true stuff. And so I love to see this roster do well. Um, I know a few people have moved on now, but ultimately it still feels like that's the, the core. And, um, you know, hopefully we see big things from them again this season. I'd really like to see them come back and be as competitive as we know they can be. Yeah, this is still mostly the same core, but obviously still mostly the same core that we saw from the M&M roster that got promoted up from Challenge League, you know, from Season 10. They made it into that season still with Nello, Kendra, Saves, and Doki. Um, they only have made one permanent roster move, and then they just had to find a way to really survive uh, through Season 10 when they made their Tokonami run. But they made a run got first place in EU and won the whole thing and did it with a substitute player. Like, if that doesn't show yep. how much resiliency uh, Na'Vi have to find, you know, just, just 
overcoming that adversity every single time. I think they can definitely do it no matter the situation they're given. And the fact that they've got Doki back in the lineup is 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 only a good thing. There's only good things from them mm-hmm. uh, as a, as a team and how they can perform. I don't see uh, them dropping nearly as hard as they did. But I also don't. I hate being able to put. Um, all their successes on the backs of one player, which if we continue to do that, talking about teams being put on the backs of one player, uh, how about Team Shiko? <laughs> Uh, Which uh, it, I, I actually, I'm going to call them that or Brie Day S the entire time. Brie Day S in there. It's, yeah. Brie Day S. You, you've Brie. got to remember, strength in depth is coming to BDS. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, Brie Day is one of the best players in the world at his role, at what he does. There's no question of that. It's going to be, you see, I think you look at the fixture today and you look at it and you think, mm, Vitality have the edge there. But let's not forget, they've got that Brie Day switch and that is going to play a factor. There's going to be some familiarity there for him, uh, you know, of that team that they're going up against. And I think that could be the surprise result today. I said this to Fluke earlier. Um, yep. I think BDS maybe come out with a win there. It's the thing about yeah, but, yeah. Well, that's it. It's like as I said, it it helps that it's against Vitality. It's a slow game. Theoretically, you you never really know how this stuff is going to go. But going by history and going by what was you know how we've seen these players and how we've seen these teams come together before, you would expect a slower game. Shiko, you know, if he shows up, he's the best player on the play day. But like, that's so best consistent. Best player on and, the planet. Yeah, mm-hmm. and and then but when he doesn't, X BDS. Oh no, it's over. And then it became, well, we still have a Lems, and now it's, well, we've got a Lems and Brie Day, and it's in no way to downplay what the other members of BDS can do, but when you've built a team around a player of that caliber, and when you've built a team around not otherwise having a plan B to rely on, Mm -hmm. things get a little bit dicey, whereas obviously a Lems was kind of used to this from playing before, and so was Brie Day, so it's really, really nice to have that. All right, I think we've touched on every team at some point individually a little bit. We're, we're here. We're in the last minute. Everything's about to get a facelift. It's already gotten a facelift, but the first game's about to begin. I think mm-hmm. it's VP and Empire playing on Clubhouse, too. It oh, is. Holy yep. shit. Oh, it's yeah. going to be huge. Apparently, oh, it's going to be um, nuts. Apparently, points are back off. I yeah, had a room. Uh, Back yeah, off. I believe points are back off, and I think don't please don't quote me on this. Um, I saw it flash up somewhere that Echo is banned as well. I I'm saw that multiple honest. times as well. I believe yeah. Echo is ineligible to play for play. Yeah, due I to can't his quote where it's come Im- from, but I believe his... that might be the case. Fluke, will you stop <laughs> that? Due to his immortal <laughs> Echo bugs. <laughs> that was that was uh, this, okay. it's like one of those confession yep. things where it's like. Mm-hmm. I heard a rumor. Ace of Pirate said this. <laughs> Who did that? <laughs> Someone, someone's leaking stuff. Okay. Who did that? Luke, Ace, we have like almost no time left. We're going to give oh. you the floor. If y'all want to plug something, plug something. It's all on you. I don't have any. I don't do anything. Don't follow my Twitter. <laughs> we tweet <laughs> rubbish. Unless you like. We took I Fluke's do podcast anything. virginity on this episode, by the way. He'd never this done is, a podcast before now. No, this is my first podcast. I was worried because I said before on like on Don't a be. cast day, I'm usually professional. And now it's like two, like an hour where I have to talk. I'm worried because uh, uh, you don't want to hear the things I have to say. That's my plug. <laughs> Take it away, Ace. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, how do you follow that? That's you know, that's the question, is it? I don't have anything to plug, really. You probably there's a very good chance that you've probably followed both of us on Twitter anyway. Just go and check out the EUL. The talent over there, the production are going to do a great job. They're going to put on an unbelievable show for us. Trust me of that. Let's just go and watch some awesome siege. Hell yeah! And with that, thank you for watching. We're going to dump you immediately into European Pro League if you're on the live stream, and if you're on the audio, this is us signing off. We've never had a closing for this. Let's not pretend we had one now.